Federation SpaceX Cargo Dragon. Today's launch, a NASA mission to deliver critical supplies and research to the astronauts living and working aboard the International Space Station. Liftoff is scheduled for 11.17 a.m. Eastern Time. Good morning and welcome to Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I'm Tori McLinden with NASA Public Affairs. We are thrilled to have you join us during this holiday season to watch the newly redesigned Cargo Dragon spacecraft begin its debut flight. Today kicks off a new series of resupply missions to the space station. The original Dragon 1 spacecraft completed its 20th and final cargo resupply mission earlier this year. Now the upgraded Dragon 2 will carry the torch with even more capacity for science payloads. It will lift off on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket from historic Launch Complex 39A. We have teams across the country following today's operations. From SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, to Mission Control in Houston, and right here in Florida. We'll also have experts um, talk with them about the science on this mission. Fueling is underway on the Falcon 9 rocket, and there's a live view as we speak. We are now at T minus 30 minutes and counting. And as with all missions to the International Space Station, the launch window today is instantaneous. That means the rocket must launch at the exact second of the planned liftoff in order to reach the correct orbit to get to the space station. Cargo Dragon will dock to the station at about 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time tomorrow, and Dragon is of course packed with critical supplies and research, but also a few items to help make the crew feel a little more at home for the holidays. We'll take a closer look at the science on board, but first, here are some basics on this mission. This will be the first launch for SpaceX under NASA's second commercial resupply services contract and the company's 21st mission of its kind. This will be the fourth flight for the Falcon 9 first stage that will once again return to Earth to be refurbished for its next mission. Cargo Dragon will deliver more than 6,400 pounds of research and supplies to the astronauts on board, and this will be the first flight for the upgraded Cargo Dragon that will now perform automated rendezvous and docking with the space station. CRS-21 is unique in so many ways. Let's take a look at what makes this cargo mission stand apart from the rest. And we are about T minus 27 minutes away from liftoff. Joining us now is NASA's Joshua Santora and Marie Lewis with an update on the launch. Hey guys, give us some good news. Hey, good morning. Yes, we do have some good news for you. We have increasingly improving weather conditions. I'm Joshua Santora, joined by Marie Lewis. Thank you. It's it's exciting to be here. I know we had a wave off yesterday because the weather uh, at the booster recovery site wasn't looking too great, but things are looking a lot better today. Yes, yeah, so we're going to go and take a look here at this graphic. Uh, we've got currently a 70% chance of good weather conditions. That means we have a 30% POV as a common term present uh, percentage of violation of those weather constraints. And it's some thick clouds that are moving through the area pretty quickly. And that speed actually is really helping us. Uh, it's like we're looking at what we've heard on these uh, audio loops we're listening into the launch 
processing countdown. Uh, things are proceeding well. We're not expected to have any of those thick cloud pockets in the area, uh, but we still have a chance of that. That coming from our launch weather officer, Melody Lovin of the U.S. Space 4th 45th Space Wing Weather Squadron. Appreciate those fine folks taking good care of us. And as you heard Tori mention, uh, fueling began uh, at T-minus 35 minutes, so it's well underway now that RP-1, which is rocket-grade kerosene, uh, liquid oxygen fueling on the first stage, uh, well underway. And then at T-minus 16 minutes, so about 10 minutes from now, we'll hear um, that liquid oxygen loading has begun on the second uh, upper stage. Yeah, we've got uh, a full staff on board today uh, from coast to coast here at the Kennedy Space Center. We are tracking this ourselves as well as there's a SpaceX team here uh, and support from NASA as well with some telemetry and communication. Uh, out in Houston, Texas at the Johnson Space Center, we have uh, teams from NASA's Mission Control who also support Space Station there and then out in California on the West Coast at Hawthorne, uh, the SpaceX headquarters and Mission Control as well. So teams keeping a close eye on things and uh, they're liking what they're seeing so far. Absolutely. And and so far, uh, things are looking green. Uh, the range is green around the pad um, and the area downrange. The rocket is healthy. We have not heard any uh, any significant issues on the nets. And uh, you you may have noticed when we were on that wider shot, the booster uh, looks like it's, uh, like it's seen better days, but that's actually because it's been reused so many times. Yes. Yeah. So this will be its fourth flight, uh, which we're excited for just that capability to use a flight proven booster. Um, so there you see on your screen, this will be the fourth flight. Uh, if, if all goes according to plans today, uh, Demo 2, our space dads, Bob and Doug, used yes. to do the same booster earlier this year. And then the Anasis 2 flight and then a Starlink mission have all used this booster. So here we go for number four. Yeah, so uh, this booster has certainly been put through its paces. And the car uh, the Cargo Dragon on top, uh, of course, is the new upgraded Cargo Dragon. And the commercial crew program is watching, uh, will be watching this mission really closely to see how this Cargo Dragon performs because it has so many similarities to the crew. Crew Dragon that just launched uh, that launched Bob and Doug earlier this year and launched uh, the Crew of Four on Crew One last month. You'll see um, on the bottom part of the capsule where the Super Dracos would have been for that launch escape system on the car. Uh, the Crew Dragon does not exist on Cargo Dragon. Uh, also inside, there's no seats obviously because it's packed with cargo instead of people. Um, and then there are no windows on the outside and only two of four uh, fins on the the trunk, the bottom half. Yeah, and obviously the purpose of this mission today is to get cargo and, and supplies to Space Station. So that ca uh, the Dragon is really broken apart into two parts. There's the capsule, which is pressurized, which holds about 9.3 cubic meters or 328 cubic feet of storage space. Um, and so that's, if you're uh, familiar with the size of a minivan, that's roughly two minivans, a little over two minivans packed full of stuff. And then the trunk, which you'll hear more about the Nanorax Bishop airlock, uh, is taking good use of the vacuum storage space. The, it's exposed to the vacuum of space as it takes off. Uh, that's about 37 cubic meters or 1,300 cubic feet. Um, a couple other noteworthy things here. We won't see solar arrays deployed during this flight. That's not a part of the Dragon 2 operation. They have solar arrays that are actually make up half of the trunk. The outside half of the trunk is the solar array. Uh, and then the nose cone, that will be kind of a big final milestone for us on our flight today, is that nose cone being opened because as we need to dock with station, we need a space to be able to dock with station and it's underneath the nose cone. Mm -hmm. And one other real quick mention, you can see in this wide shot the crew access arm that has retracted away already from Cargo Dragon. This was the first time that SpaceX used that crew access arm to load cargo on a cargo resupply mission. They've obviously used it before for the crew missions, uh, but this is the first time they used uh, that arm to load cargo for a cargo resupply mission. So we are now at T minus 23 minutes, six seconds and counting. Again, we have an instantaneous launch window at 11.17 and eight seconds this morning Eastern time. Time, and SpaceX will attempt to land that first stage booster a fourth time, this time uh, over the Atlantic Ocean on the Of Course I Still Love You drone ship. So we'll be keeping an eye on that about eight minutes and some change after launch. Uh, but for now, Tori, we will send it back to you. Thanks for the update. We'll check back in with you later. Sounds like everything is looking good so far for today's launch. Cargo resupply missions from U.S. companies like the one today ensure a national capability to deliver critical science research to the space station. Now, this significantly increases NASA's ability to conduct new investigations in a microgravity environment at the only laboratory in space. The ISS National Lab gives us a closer look at some of this groundbreaking research. SpaceX's 21st Commercial Resupply Services mission to the International Space Station is ready to launch from Kennedy Space Center. 
This mission will bring critical cargo, research, and technology demonstration payloads to the orbiting laboratory. The ISS National Laboratory is proud to sponsor more than 15 payloads on this mission, representing dozens of experiments to further fundamental and applied research through space-based inquiry and to engage the next generation of researchers and explorers. Here's a quick look at some of the payloads on SpaceX CRS-21. Bristol Myers Squibb, a leading pharmaceutical company, is launching a protein crystallization investigation aimed at improving drug formulation and delivery for patients on Earth. In this experiment, the team will study the crystallization of monoclonal antibodies in space to improve their crystallization back on the ground. Monoclonal antibodies are lab-created proteins designed to interact with specific targets called antigens and are used in the treatment of several diseases, including cancer. Three projects on this mission are funded by the National Institutes of Health through its joint Multi-Year Tissue Chips in Space initiative with the ISS National Lab. Tissue chips are small devices engineered to grow human cells on an artificial scaffold to model the structure and function of human tissues. Studying tissue chips in space may accelerate pathways for understanding disease and developing new treatments for use on Earth and beyond. To learn more about all ISS National Lab sponsored research on this mission, please visit issnationallab.org. Among all of this life-changing science, the heart tissue chips experiment is quite fascinating. NASA's Jasmine Hopkins is standing by with a special guest who can tell us more. Jasmine. Thank you so much, Tori. I'm Jasmine Hopkins, and joining me to talk to us more about the Cardinal Heart Tissue Chip investigation is Dr. Dilip Thomas, postdoctoral fellow from the Stanford Cardiovascular Institute. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Thomas. Thank you, Jasmine, for having me. Absolutely. Can you tell us what this investigation is about? Absolutely. So the Cardinal Heart Tissue Chip research is born out of an academic collaboration between Stanford Cardiovascular Institute uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, Biosphere Space Technologies, and the ISS National Labs. The research is funded by the National Institutes of Health and the National Center of Advances in uh, Translational Sciences. And we are a part of uh, the Tissue Chip Consortium. So as one of the uh, leading uh, uh, cardiovascular groups uh, in the nation, we're interested in how uh, a heart disease develop and how we can use better medications to treat them. Uh, the Cardinal Heart Experiment that's launching on the ISS we are particularly interested in how microgravity affects the heart. And we are doing so using a, an engineered heart tissue that is grown in the lab, um, which is basically a small muscle strip of your heart uh, that beats spontaneously. Now you may ask, why is this research important? So uh, on Earth, we know that our heart uh, takes the shape of the letter V. And in microgravity, it takes the shape of the letter O. The reason being uh, that a phenomena called mechanical unloading meaning that when we are on Earth, our heart has to work hard against gravity to push all that blood throughout our body. And, in, and, and it's that exercise that keeps the heart healthy and fit. And when we take that exercise away from uh, the heart in microgravity, it has to work very less. And as a result, over time, long for long durations of time, it can get weaker and lead to a condition called heart failure. Now in the United States, uh, there's about 6.2 million adults who suffer from this condition of heart failure. So we want to use microgravity as a platform to study how this phenomenon occurs and bring uh, and test uh, new drugs that are FDA approved uh, to reverse the effects of the uh, aging and such uh, cardiac complications. Uh, not only that, uh, the uh, research will also provide us insights into how uh, a heart may function during long-term space expeditions for our astronauts and space explorers. Well, that is fascinating. And we know that our uh, team in space is eager to get their hands on your research, but can you tell us about your team on Earth that helped you develop it? Absolutely. So uh, we, as a team of scientists and engineers, we are thrilled to be a part of the space biology community. And it's always exciting to bring the research from the lab to the launch pad. And we have come, me and my team have come to an appreciation, greater appreciation for how uh, a, a billion parts has to be uh, enabled to move this research uh, to the ISS. And uh, here I would like to acknowledge my team, so if you can bring up the photo of my team. So here from left to right, uh, we see uh, Dr. Luis Zia from Biosphere Space Technologies, my mentor, Dr. Joseph Wu, uh, and uh, Sushma Shinoy from, uh, from Stanford. And we also have Dr. Orlando Chirikian from UCSB. So to celebrate all the teamwork that we have put into this Cardinal Heart experiment, we have designed a cool mission patch, uh, which you can see on the screen, that shows all our collaborators on this particular project, 
And right at the center, you see the cartoon of an engineered heart tissue that we are sending up to the space station. So we are super excited and thrilled. So go NASA, go SpaceX, go Dragon. Awesome. We are uh, very excited to see your science launch to space. So let's actually get back to Tori in the studio for a launch update. Tori. Thanks, Jasmine. We are now at T minus 16 minutes and counting. Let's check in with SpaceX and Hawthorne, where the company designed and built its Falcon 9 rocket and cargo dragon. Shiva Bharadvaj is joining us live. Shiva, how's it going on the West Coast? Hey, thanks, Tori. Mission control teams are monitoring the vehicle heading into launch. But let's talk about the Dragon spacecraft. Dragon debuted in 2012 as the first private spacecraft in history to visit the International Space Station. And actually, since then, Dragons have made 23 trips to and from. Today, it's actually one of the few vehicles that can deliver significant cargo to the space station and the only vehicle that can deliver cargo from the station. Now, we've refreshed and updated Dragon's design to fly people, and we've actually done that twice this year on our Demo 2 and Crew 1 missions. But today's mission marks another first for Dragon, and that's the first flight of the cargo version of our updated Dragon design. Now, Dragon was designed from the beginning to be reused. To date, we've actually flown nine Dragon missions with reused vehicles. And this new version can support up to five flights to and from the space station, as opposed to three on our previous design. In addition, it's about 20% larger, boasts double the powered lockers on board, so that's space for powered science experiments, biological life science experiments, and it also splashes down in the Atlantic Ocean, which allows us to return those scientific payloads within a few hours after landing. Now, on the outside, this vehicle looks very similar to what you may have seen on our Demo 2 and Crew 1 missions, but this vehicle is configured a little bit differently since we don't have people on board. In the pressure section, which is that top portion there, um, what we've swapped out the seats and the crew displays for cargo racks and straps. We've also removed the Super Draco engines, those only being used to carry astronauts away from the Falcon 9 in the unlikely event of a pad or a launch abort. And finally, the environmental system has also been reduced in size and complexity since we don't have people on board. Now, flying NASA astronauts and keeping the space station fully operational is a top priority for SpaceX. This mission is actually the first operational resupply as part of NASA's second commercial resupply services contract, and we're on contract to provide supplies through 2024. And the whole team here is super excited to see this Dragon arrive at the space station tomorrow, and for the first time ever to see two Dragons attached to the International Space Station. So with that, back to you, Tori. Thanks, Shiva. These upgrades to the Cargo Dragon bring tremendous benefit to NASA and its ability to resupply the space station and conduct critical research. Joining us now is NASA's Leah Cheshire at Johnson Space Center in Houston to tell us more about this mission. Leah. Hi, Tori, and thanks so much. Welcome to the International Space Station Flight Control Room here in Houston, Texas at Johnson Space Center. This is currently the Orbit 2 team of flight controllers. They are monitoring the systems aboard the International Space Station 24-7, 365 days a year. And today they are led by Flight Director Paul Kanya. This team will really jump into action tomorrow as Cr Cargo Dragon approaches the International Space Station and enters the Approach Ellipsoid. That's a uh, an imaginary sphere around the International Space Station that helps us monitor vehicles as they arrive and depart as well. Currently living on the International Space Station, we have seven people. That consists of two Russian cosmonauts, Sergei Ryzhikov and Sergei Kuzferchkov, as well as our four NASA astronauts, uh, Kate Rubens, Mike Hopkins, Victor Glover, and Shannon Walker, and JAXA astronaut Soichi Noguchi. Once Crew Dragon Cargo Dragon arrives to the International Space Station, it will be joining a Crew Dragon as well as four other vehicles. That'll be two Russian Progress Resupply spacecraft, one Russian Soyuz spacecraft, and Northrop Grumman's 14th resupply mission to the International Space Station. Cargo Dragon will remain on board the International Space Station for about a month before being packed up with critical science and supplies and splashing down in the Atlantic Ocean, delivering that science to be analyzed on Earth. When Cargo Dragon arrives tomorrow, the crew aboard the International Space Station will not capture it as they have previously using the Canada Arm 2, but instead, NASA astronauts Kate Rubens and Victor Glover will monitor the arrival of Cargo Dragon. Everything is looking good here in Mission Control Houston. We're excited for launch today, and we'll send it back to you at Kennedy.
Thanks, Leah. We're excited for today's launch as well. Let's take an even closer look at some of the research the Expedition 64 crew will be conducting. BioAsteroid is an experiment to study whether we can use microorganisms, bacteria or fungi, to extract economically interesting elements from asteroid material. It's essentially what we would call a biomining experiment. In other words, mining in support of the long-term human exploration and settlement of space. The brain organoid is a miniaturized version of uh, developing human brain, so this uh, really mimics the early stages of uh, human brain development. Being able to perhaps accelerate these uh, brain organoid maturation could help us make better human models for neurodegenerative disorders for which for most of them we don't have any treatments or cures. If you go to a hospital or a clinic and you have a medical problem, like an infection, you often get a blood test called a white blood cell count and differential. That's a capability we don't have right now in spaceflight. So our objective is to test out this device that can be used in space so the astronauts can diagnose and treat their own medical problems. And Jasmine is joining us again, this time with an expert from the ISS National Lab. Jasmine? Thank you, Tori. Yes, here to talk to us about the U.S. National Lab is Patrick O'Neill. Thanks so much for being here, Patrick. Thanks, Jasmine. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Can you tell us about the amazing payloads that you'll be managing on this mission? Yeah, so right now we're slated to have more than 15 investigations that are launching on this mission. And the other day, Dr. Kirk Costello from the ISS program, uh, he made mention of the fact that this was a very life science rich uh, mission, and he is spot on with that. And from our perspective, we're really seeing a wide array of life science investigations that are on this mission. I believe that we just saw a video from a brain organoid payload from uh, a group over at UC San Diego. But then on top of that, we also have a variety of tissue chip investigations that are flying that are sponsored uh, through one of the centers associated with the National Institutes of Health. Uh, so we're really excited about that. But then also there's some microbial research that's going to be happening. And then we also have uh, some big pharmaceutical companies that are sending investigations on this mission. So again, it really does showcase the diversity that we have within the life science communities and, and, and the types of research that's possible on the space station. Absolutely. We know that uh, the U.S. National Lab is managing more than 15 payloads on this mission, which is a pretty uh, big lift. So can you tell us, is there anything that sticks out to you? What, what, what I would say that's really interesting about this mission is we're seeing a lot of investigations that are going up for the second or third time. And so it's the idea of iteration. So it's it, what, we're, what we're able to see out of this is that they're learning something the first time they fly, but then now they're able to extrapolate that and take that into their next investigations. And maybe that leads to applied applications one day down the road uh, for either benefiting life on Earth or setting the foundation for a robust and thriving uh, low Earth orbit economy. And then on top of that, what I would say too is we have a lot of student investigations that are flying on this mission. And I think that that's one of the really exciting aspects of the National Laboratory is the fact that we are opening access to all types of researchers, whether you're a seasoned researcher or you're a young researcher. Uh, the, the, the notion that the space is the foundation for a thriving low Earth orbit economy. Patrick, that is fantastic. And we are so excited to see all of this science launch to space today. Uh, so let's take it back to Tori for another launch update. Tori? Thanks, Jasmine. I'm sure the astronauts on board the space station are eagerly awaiting their delivery. And it looks like they won't have to wait much longer with just about eight minutes to go before launch. Let's head back over to Joshua and Marie to take us through liftoff. Guys, how are we looking? All right, thank you so much, Tori. Well, uh, good news to report. We've heard very little chatter um, on the nets, and that's a good thing. Uh, no news is good news. It's been relatively quiet. Rocket is healthy. Um, again, as you said, uh, well, we're inside eight minutes. Now we're at T minus uh, seven minutes and 40 seconds. Yeah, you always get a little bit anxious with that much quiet. Uh, but again, like you said, it's it's a good thing. Yes. Uh, we have to remind ourselves of that. So we're excited to hear for this today. Uh, we're expecting to hear a few things coming up. Um, one of them, uh, a call for internal power. Uh, that would be the Dragon moving to internal power, meaning that it's primed and ready to live on its own apart from ground support equipment. Uh, we're also looking for the engine chill to begin um, in just a minute. Um, actually, in just about 15 seconds, we should hopefully hear that. That's the cooling of the uh, Merlin 1D engines at the base of the first stage. That's to prepare them to receive cryogenic fuel. You don't want to run temperatures of negative 330 degrees below zero into lukewarm or atmospheric temperature um, engines. So we just heard that call uh, for the engine chill. So that came just inside of T minus seven minutes. 
Um, in about T minus five minutes, so less than two minutes from now, uh, we should hear that the RP1, again, that's that rocket grade kerosene uh, fueling will be complete. And then uh, the action will really start to pick up uh, after that point. The, uh, the transporter, erector, or strong back, which provides fluid, power, and communication to the rocket, um, that will kind of open its clamp and tilt back ever so slightly in preparation for liftoff. Again, this this is the first uh, cargo vehicle, Cargo Dragon, that will dock, uh, not just dock, but dock autonomously to the International Space Station. And so uh, tomorrow afternoon it will be uh, approaching and then docking to the Node 2 Harmony Zenith port. Uh, that happens to be the same port that the Crew Dragon Resilience will relocate to um, after this Cargo Dragon departs in January. That will clear the Node 2 forward port for Crew 2 arrival in the spring. So if you uh, remember that graphic, uh, that Leah showed while she was talking. It, I mean, it reminded me of a full parking lot <laughs> this time at the space station. So that's a good thing. Lots of visiting vehicle traffic at the space station and the Cargo Dragon, just the next one to make a stop there. Yeah, just a point of clarification. Uh, we've obviously mentioned that there's been a, almost a couple dozen missions with the Dragon to space station, and those berthed. They didn't dock. And, and for those that aren't familiar, uh, that is a difference there. So just to kind of make that point, um, uh, the start of the show here in just about five and a half minutes is going to be the Falcon. So talking through this vehicle and what it can do. It's a two-stage rocket, roughly 230 feet tall, 12 feet in diameter. At the base of that rocket, you've got nine Merlin-1D engines that will produce roughly 1.7 million pounds of thrust at liftoff. And then that's the first two-thirds of the rocket. And then the next segment is a very dark black uh, inner stage adapter, and that's connecting the first and second stage that actually houses the Merlin vacuum engine, which will power the second stage to the correct orbit. They're a great call, Dragons and Terminal Count. Um, that's what we're looking for. Uh, so we are progressing forward here. Uh, we've, there we go. There's the internal call, the internal power call officially. Um, we also have hypersonic grid fins at the top of the first stage, as well as carbon fiber landing legs, which will help us successfully land this for hopefully the, the fourth time. Mm -hmm. That will be really exciting to see. And we haven't heard it just yet, but we, if we do momentarily, I will just stop talking, so I may stop mid-sentence. But we expect to hear uh, that the transporter erector at least see uh, that clamp beginning to open uh, in preparation to tilt back before liftoff. So that should be happening any moment now. So while we're waiting there for that, uh, we're on our way to space station. We've talked about that uh, a good bit. Uh, the space station is actually in the uh, over top of the Indian Ocean, headed on a west to east track, uh, about to kind of round uh, around the southern portion of Australia. So uh, we're roughly on a 24-hour intercept pace to get there, uh, but that's kind of a quick update for you. And again, when Dragon docks, uh, it will be tomorrow, December 7th, at approximately 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and there you see the transporter erector. If you look to the right of your screen, it's tilting back ever so slightly. And that, again, is what happens in preparation for liftoff. And that tilt's continuing. And looks like that is complete and just gorgeous skies surrounding the launch pad right now. The thick clouds look as if they're staying offshore. We can't see directly above the rocket, which is the important part of the sky, but things are looking really good at the moment. All right, we are just inside T minus three minutes now. Uh, so in less than a minute, we should hear that the range is go and uh, stage two locks close out. Stage one locks is closed out for flight. That was at stage one, liquid oxygen close out. So the first stage is fueled. Uh, and we should stop seeing that venting, which you can see on your screen there. If you see uh, some of the condensation of the air forming around the rocket, um, that's just a matter of the cryogenic temperature of the vehicle, the fuel uh, mixing with the atmospheric weather. We do fuel as close to zero as possible. SpaceX fuels as close to zero as possible, and that's because it's they're using densified liquid oxygen. They're trying to pack literally as much as they can in there to maximize the performance of the vehicle to support the customer's needs. We are closing in on T minus two minutes now and expect to hear a couple of calls momentarily. Stage two locks is closed down for flight.
there's that stage two locks closeout call. Dragon is in auto idle. And we're now at T minus 1 minute 33 seconds and counting, and Falcon 9 should be in startup in less than 30 seconds. Falcon 9 from the startup. Dragon and is in countdown. And there it is right on time. Falcon 9 is in startup. Dragon is in countdown. So we are at T minus 50 seconds and counting. LD on countdown 1. Go for launch. And there is that go for launch call we love to hear. T minus 38 seconds. At T minus 18, we will see T that accounting. sound suppression system begin to flood the pad just before liftoff. T minus 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, Two, one, and liftoff of the Falcon 9 and upgraded Cargo Dragon, the first cargo capsule to dock to the International Space Station. Stage one propulsion is now. Supersonic, obviously exceeding the speed of sound, and then max Q, maximum aerodynamic pressure. That's from passing through an atmosphere that is still fairly thick while increasing speed dramatically. They throttle back slightly uh, just to be able to make sure that the vehicle can handle those loads, and then they'll accelerate back up. Uh, a beautiful shot there on screen. Uh, you can see the plume coming and off. Back of, and flight chill has started. You can see the plume coming off of the, the base of that first stage where the nine Merlin 1D engines are firing. Uh, we heard the chill call for the vacuum engine to begin as well, uh, preparing that to take the second stage to the correct orbit. Coming up here in about 30 seconds, we're going to hear and see uh, a, a rapid succession of things happening. We're going to hear a call for Miko. That's the booster, the main engine cutoff. Uh, that's, it's completing its, its job of getting the spacecraft out of the atmosphere. Uh, we'll also follow that up with the first stage being separated, following a parabolic trajectory back towards the drone ship. And then very shortly after that will be the second stage engine start. Uh, that's that Merlin vacuum engine we talked about. Nico one. Stage separation confirmed. There you see a beautiful shot, the first stage falling away. And back ignition confirmed. And that MVAC ignition confirmed. There you see it on screen. Uh, you can see on the left side, you can kind of see that plume coming out, and you'll see that engine bell increasingly get more of that beautiful orange color to it uh, that says we're just increasing the heat and picking up the pace. Uh, the two camera angles you see here are on reverse sides of that engine, so you're seeing a single engine there just from opposite directions. 
as we continue on a nominal call, we heard a number of those during the, the uphill climb as well. Beautiful launch today, just stunning. And, and again, all the calls we've heard have been nominal up to this point. So all things looking great. There you see on the left-hand side of your screen that first stage continuing on. Those hypersonic grid fins are now expanded. Uh, those won't be usable until they re-enter the atmosphere. Uh, obviously, without the atmosphere, those, that kind of directioning just isn't helpful. But once they enter the atmosphere, you'll see those begin to move, pitch, and roll uh, to be able to target that pinpoint landing on, of course, I still love you, the drone ship. We've got less than five minutes till Trajectory we expect nominal. that to happen. Stage two propulsion is nominal. A couple more great nominal call call outs there. Uh, so just previewing what's ahead at about six and a half minutes into flight, we're going to have the entry burn for the first stage headed towards that drone ship. Just acquisition of signal in Bermuda. So that's just a communication call. Uh, you, you might hear more of those as we go through the process today. That's just a matter of there are ground stations across the world, literally, uh, that help pick up and track the vehicle as we send telemetry data back to Earth for the mission for the controllers to be able to monitor progress and ensure everything is proceeding nominally. And, and really noteworthy that booster uh, just launched its fourth payload. Uh, into space. And one of those uh, actually was more significant than a payload. Bob and Doug earlier this year, that, that same booster launched two humans into space. Uh, so really, really great, amazing accomplishment that uh, that uh, the same booster has been reused uh, a Trajectory fourth time. Nominal. After we get that entry burn, uh, a couple minutes later, we will have the second stage engine cutoff. Uh, that puts us at having a, a roughly six minute burn of the second stage and then at almost the exact same instant we're expecting the uh the first stage landing to occur and then a few minutes more we'll see the separation of the dragon from that second stage we've we've seen some beautiful shots this morning uh in preparation for launch um, so hopefully we'll get to bring you that live uh, again beautiful to see that dragon just separate what feels like ever so gently at a at a cool seventeen thousand five hundred miles an hour. Oh yeah, just a just a nice easy coast, right? Um, you know what's really what's really exciting to look back and and realize. You know, the Dragon is on its way to the space station, uh, the first of nine cargo resupply missions under this brand new contract. But it just so happens on this day in history, 22 years ago, began the assembly of the International Space Station. Trajectory nominal. Obviously, an incredible international collaboration, mm -hmm. uh, and really, we're we're kind of ushering in the era of having commercial companies contribute to that collaboration. And so, what a what a privilege it is to be a part of this portion of history yes. of the space station and our exploration, not only to low Earth orbit but also into deep space. Yeah. So, 22 years later, uh, from the the, be the very beginnings of the International Space Station, now uh, they're having to move spacecraft around to open up ports for uh, all the new visiting vehicles. So it's really, really an amazing achievement, a uh, result of the cooperation between so many nations, uh, government, and industry together. Yeah, Marie, pleasure to have you with me. It's been fun. Stage one, entry burn startup. We're going we're gonna to call it a day for us here, but we're going to stay with the rest of the process and send it now back to SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne. Uh, Shiva, congratulations to you and the, the SpaceX team. They're on a great launch. Looking forward to the next few milestones with you. Yeah, thanks, guys. Um, so nominal. actually, if we could go back to the shot of the, the vehicle, we're actually just in the middle of our entry burn. Um, that's where we ignite three of the Merlin-1D engines, so we're slowing down the first stage as we come into stage contact one, with the atmosphere. Down. Just shut that down, so that burn lasting about 30 seconds. From here on out, um, you can actually see the attitude control thrusters there firing. That's those little plumes of white gas. And then the grid fins, those as we get more and more atmospheric pressure on the vehicle will guide the first stage towards our drone ship named, of course, I Still Love You. Uh, taking a look at the data for the second stage, Dragon is running right down the middle of the uh, projected orbit on the second stage, going for a roughly circular orbit, uh, and then about T plus 11 minutes, uh, 11 and a half minutes into flight, we'll expect to see Dragon separation. Uh, at this point, next event coming up, uh, so on our screen right now is our shots of the second stage, but next event coming up for the first stage, stage is one, uh, Falcon flying. 9's landing burn. That's about 30 seconds away. Um, we'll ignite just a single center Merlin engine, then shortly after that, deploy the landing legs, and then attempt a soft touchdown on our drone ship, uh, named, of course, I Still Love You, stationed out in the Atlantic. 
10 seconds out to our landing burn on the first stage. Second stage continuing to look nominal. Stage one, landing burn startup. Call it there from the prop team. So this burn expected to last about 25 seconds. In the middle of this, we'll also have shutdown of the second stage's uh, MVAC engine. Coming up uh, just a few seconds from now. Stage one, landing leg deploy. So landing leg deployment on the first stage, hopefully stick the landing. Okay. Shot from our drone ship. Stage one. And landing. there is the fourth successful landing of this Falcon 9. Uh, exciting news as well. This is the hundredth successful flight of Falcon 9. It's our 68th successful first stage. You also heard the call out there for nominal orbital insertion on the second stage. So that means Dragon is in the target orbit, still attached to our second stage. Uh, 100 successful landings of Falcon 9, fourth landing of this booster, which first flew Bob and Doug to space. Uh, 35th landing actually on this drone ship. Uh, coming up next in about two minutes from now, two minutes and 20 seconds, we'll expect to see deployment of the Dragon spacecraft from the second stage. Now, if you're just joining us, um, we had an on-time liftoff at 11.17 a.m. Eastern Time, successfully recovered the first stage, which you can see on your screen. Dragon attached to the second stage in orbit around the planet. Second stage doing some checks right now, at verifying that its attitude is appropriate for Dragon separation shortly after. All in all, very nominal mission so far, uh, and just what we want to see. So uh, with that, I think uh, we can actually check in with the flight controllers at NASA's Johnson Space Center who have been monitoring the mission. Leah, how are things going over there? Hi, Sheva. Thank you. An amazing launch, and things are going well over here, too. Uh, flight controllers here are monitoring the International Space Station, and as I mentioned earlier, they will begin joint operations tomorrow once Cargo Dragon enters the approach ellipsoid, or a, an invisible sphere around the International Space Station that's four kilometers by two kilometers by two kilometers and helps us monitor the approach and departure of visiting vehicles. We have seen second stage separation and obviously that first stage landing on the drone ship. Next major milestone we'll be looking for is for second stage cutoff and then eventually second stage separation from the Cargo Dragon when Cargo Dragon will begin flying free on its own. We'll be looking for a separation to come in just about 30 seconds now. Shortly thereafter, there will be some checkouts performed on the service section Draco thrusters on the vehicle. At the time of launch today, the International Space Station was flying 257 statute miles over the southern Indian Ocean west of Perth, Australia. As we mentioned earlier, we have a full house aboard the International Space Station of seven people and five visiting vehicles. That will turn into six tomorrow. As Murray mentioned, a full parking lot, home for the holidays. Dragon separation confirmed. And with second stage separation confirmed, Crew Dra Cargo Dragon is now flying free on its own, continuing its journey to the International Space Station. Next major milestone coming up in just a few moments will begin the nose cone deploy, revealing those bulkhead thrusters underneath. Those will be used for some of the burns throughout Cargo Dragon's next 24 hours as it begins its approach to the International Space Station.
and we've heard confirmation of nose cone deploy and some good checkouts of those thrusters. Next up, we have a special guest, Jeff Arend, the Systems Engineering Integration Office Manager of the International Space Station, is standing by to tell us a little bit more about today's mission. Thanks so much for joining us, Jeff. I'm more than, more than happy to join you. I have a few questions for you. So the Cargo Dragon is now en route to the station. Can you explain the differences and similarities for this vehicle with the Crew Dragon vehicle we saw arrive at the station last month, and any similarities and differences in the rendezvous profile for an automated docking? Yeah, I'd be happy to talk to that. Um, so just basically, you know, if you actually just look at the vehicle, the, the outer mold line is essentially the same. There's actually some some minor differences, but the average eye would not would not pick up that there's any difference between the uh, the cargo and the and the crude version of the vehicle. Um, but at the same time, probably one of the most important things is that from an ISS crew and vehicle safety perspective, the vehicles are identical. So they're they're equally safe vehicles for cargo and crew. Um, one of the differences, one of the big differences between crew and cargo is. There, uh, there's no, there's no super Dracos on the cargo vehicle. There's, there's no need for a launch escape system to, uh, to protect the crew. So that, that's, that's probably the biggest difference from a, from an overall safety point of view. Um, this vehicle is, uh, is a little bit more capable from a powered locker point of view, which helps us a lot on, on science and research. We have uh, eight lockers, eight powered lockers going up, twelve coming coming home or for the descent cargo where the crude vehicle only has about only has four powered lockers on, on the way home. Um, obviously a big piece is, is we have to remove the crew accommodations for the for the uh, from the crew drag in order to accommodate the uh, the cargo, science, research, vehicle systems, all those kind of all that kind of hardware in the in the cargo version of the vehicle. Um, let me see. You also asked about uh, about the rendezvous profile. So the rendezvous profile uh, and prox ops are essentially the same um, the, between the two vehicles. If uh, independent of which port they go to, I would tell you they're the same. Uh, the big difference for uh, for this mission is SpaceX 21. The cargo version is going to our Zenith port, ISS Zenith port. So so basically everything's the same through what I would call R bar intercept. To, um, to actually where it, it interfaces or intercepts the velocity vector on space station. Um, at that point, the, the vehicle will be at about 220 meters out. Rather than stopping on the V-bar, this vehicle is just going to continue a 90-degree rotation above ISS. And, uh, and so it'll be basically on the minus R-bar, uh, about 200 meters out, and from there, um, the vehicle will translate to its final waypoint, which we call waypoint waypoint two, which is 20 meters out. Do a hold there, and from there it'll it'll uh, proceed to docking. Hope that, hope that was all clear. Yes, it did come through. Thank you so much. So once Cargo Dragon docks, we will have two Dragons for the first time at adjacent ports on the International Space Station. How will NASA and SpaceX teams handle the operations of both vehicles from a timeline and communication loop standpoint? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, it turns out that uh, that uh, you call the dueling Dragons. I don't know if I've actually heard that term. That's interesting. but. Um, we we kind of had the practice. The teams had quite a bit of practice uh, on what I would call dueling dragons even before the launch, um, and that was really at you know as in preparations for the launch. There's a fair bit of communication between the SpaceX team at Hawthorne, the SpaceX team at KSC, of course the other folks at KSC, um, and and at times with ISS. So even before we've launched here with the, with the with uh, the cargo dragon on the pad and at KSC, there were some preparations that we needed to do. They just need to configure their consoles, set up their commanding, and, and do their and, and view their telemetry, and make sure they're communicating to cargo dragon and not to the crew dragon on ISS. Um, 
Likewise, uh, there was a the um, the crew dragon. Every every 30 days or so, we wake it up. With, it basically is in a quiescent mode when it's on ISS. And every 30 days, we do a health and status check on that vehicle. And so again, SpaceX and the, and their team and the NASA team needs to kind of reconfigure their commanding and communication method with each of the vehicles such that it, it actually now talks to the crew dragon and not the cargo dragon. Um, so, so they get some practice on that even before um, SpaceX 21 will show up to ISS. And as I kind of alluded to, um, the cargo dragon, excuse me, the crew dragon, we, we basically put it in non-quiescent mode or excuse me, into a quiescent mode when it's on orbit. So as soon as Cargo Dragon shows up, it, it gets it basically gets the full attention of the crew and uh, and the flight control team. Um, much of its cargo needs to be removed within within hours, if not days. And uh, with all the science and research on board, pretty much the it gets it gets our undivided attention and the crew's undivided attention from a from a timeline perspective. That's great. Always prepared. Love it. So <laughs> we've discussed the upgrades to this vehicle and how it's very similar to Crew Dragon, carrying an increased amount of research, hardware, and other payloads. So what does that mean for the astronauts on station? Um, in a word, they're going to be, like, extremely busy. <laughs> <laughs> um, the this vehicle is bringing almost a metric ton of research, science, and, uh, and, and just all utilization items, about a metric ton worth of, of cargo, much of which needs to be exercised and um, within the 30-day mission, that 30 days or thereabouts, I can't remember exactly how many days we're, we're planning for this vehicle. 28 to 31 is what I'd guess, but um, most of that work needs to be done while while the vehicle is there. So they only have the, the 30 days or so to get everything off, everything exercised, all the research completed, um, and then they need to pack it. That, that exercise research, they need to pack that to come home so that we can quickly turn it around and get it to the labs on, uh, on the ground here. Um, so, yeah, they're going to be super busy, I guess is what I would tell you. And I'm sure they're looking forward to it. Uh, the Nanorax Bishop airlock will be the first commercial module added to the station. So can you discuss how this helps open the station to more customers and commercial companies? Yeah, that's a very good question as well. So you're right, the Nanorax airlock, Bishop airlock, so it was conceived, designed, and built um, by Nanorax to meet the needs of its customers. Um, Nanorax retains the ownership of this airlock. And so they are really driven to find paying customers to, uh, in order to make the commercial module profitable. And these users will likely be commercial customers. And these business-to-business -business transactions, we're hoping, and I think they will, will increase the economic development of low Earth orbit. Um, you know, in the past, the, the, what we call the GEM airlock or the Japanese exposed module airlock sometimes has been kind of a bottleneck for us to, to do material science and material science research, certainly all the jettisons of the various satellites that we've been putting out. So this is a larger volume. It gives us the opportunity to, to do more deploys, um, a larger group at a time. It also provides some flexibility for ORUs that we can't bring inside um, and so maybe we can we can stimulate business in, in that way as well. But uh, to me, it's an exciting time, and uh, and we're we're just looking forward to having it on orbit. Thanks so much, Jeff, for joining us today and uh, sharing all of that information about the mission with us. We are still here in the International Space Station Flight Control Room in Houston. Flight controllers are monitoring the status of the station itself. And what you can look forward to tomorrow will be the arrival of Cargo Dragon to the International Space Station. So once it crosses that approach ellipsoid, teams here will begin joint operations with the SpaceX team in Hawthorne, California. NASA astronauts, 
Victor Glover and Kate Rubens will be monitoring the approach and arrival of Cargo Dragon as it makes the first docking by a Cargo Dragon to the International Space Station. They will uh, begin working then to get the hatch open on Cargo Dragon. That'll take a couple of hours because it includes pressurizing the vestibule or the space between the hatches on the International Space Station and on Cargo Dragon itself. But for right now, everything looking great with a beautiful launch today, and we're looking forward to the arrival tomorrow. So that's our wrap here in Houston and back to you at KSC. Thanks, Leah. Wow, what a beautiful launch and landing and by far one of my favorite things on the Space Coast. I mean, the rumble never gets old. And Cargo Dragon is now on its way to the International Space Station with the help of U.S. companies like SpaceX and our astronauts in space like the Expedition 64 crew. NASA is using the station to conduct cutting-edge research and technology development in preparation to send the first woman and the next man to the moon in 2024. And then we'll use what we learned there to take the next giant leap, sending astronauts to Mars. You can tune in to docking coverage on NASA TV tomorrow, starting at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Time, with docking at 1.30 p.m. That's going to wrap up our coverage. I'm Tori McLinden, and from everyone here at NASA's Kennedy Space Center and our colleagues across the country, thank you so much for joining us. For more information on this mission, visit nasa.gov forward slash station or nasa.gov forward slash SpaceX. We leave you now with another look at today's spectacular launch. Happy holidays, everyone, and go CRS-21. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And liftoff of the Falcon 9 and upgraded Cargo Dragon the first cargo capsule to dock to the International Space Station. Stage one propulsion all the time.